Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Voices, a library lecture series. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mahikiniak or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today, the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present. Voices presents speakers on timely and enduring issues each semester to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Please fill out a survey at the link on our homepage to help inform our future programming. Today, Voices presents Brittany McAndrew, Business Development Executive for Upstate Tiny Homes. McAndrew's work draws on her personal experience with tiny living all over the world. Brittany is well known for her ability to navigate the legal and mechanical challenges posed by government regulation and industry standards. She is a board member for the Tiny, uh, Tiny Home Industry Association, as well as Time for Homes, a nonprofit which aims to end homelessness, based in Troy, New York. Please welcome Brittany McAndrew. Hello, and thank you so much for that warm welcome. Thank you to the staff uh, here at HVCC, the lecture series committee, students, faculty, and anyone else tuning in today. So today, I want to address several topics that are related to tiny homes. Um, my plan is to start with the basics, and as we begin to grasp the fundamentals, we'll move on to who lives tiny, how, typical obstacles that uh, focus primarily on New York State, and how to advocate for and legitimize tiny living. There's also a very real need for tiny homes in all forms that I plan on covering with you today. So first, I should, suppose I should start off by answering the question, what is a tiny home? We've all seen them by now featured on shows like Tiny House Nation, the YouTube channels that show shipping container conversions, earth homes, yurts, off-grid cabins, you may have thought how smart, how cool, how creative, and you also could have been one of those people that thought that those people are crazy. So really, you're all right. <laughs> um, now, are all of those tiny homes? A tiny home has only recently been given a definition. The IRC, or the International Residential Code, defines a tiny home as a dwelling that's under 400 square feet, excluding lofts. Seems simple enough. When I think back to the first time that I heard of a tiny home, it was just about a decade ago. I was in my early 20s. I was in a very different place in my life, and I had been renting a small house in the city of St. Petersburg, Florida. This house was really special, and I knew it. It was one of five small houses on a lovely, flat, palm tree dotted acre and a half. There was a larger main house where an older single woman lived, and she owned the property and the cottages. Each cottage was about 550 square feet. They were all positioned a little bit differently, so no one was on top of anyone. Each property had its own home, or, or I'm sorry, own front porch, back porch, um, separate driveways, and we all respected each other in this quiet little community. It wasn't high end, but I had everything I needed, and it was affordable. I loved that little house, but I knew it wasn't an option to buy. Even if I could, I didn't have any money. <laughs> Not real money, anyway. Not down payment and mortgage money. Besides that, I knew I wasn't done traveling, and I couldn't imagine making the commitment that it would take to put down roots, or a literal foundation, in this one area. There was some, so much more that I wanted to see. But still, I dreamed of owning my, my own tiny home. My plan at the time was to travel across country in a pop-up camper with my then boyfriend and good friend, when I came across a YouTube video of a guy building a house that he could tow with him. I had never heard of that before. I thought that was genius. Uh, I had four walls, he was framing it, there were real windows, a roof, a kitchen, a bed, and a bathroom, all on wheels. So without the appropriate context, you might think I just described an RV. <laughs> and you're not really wrong, but this was different. Those who know, know there is a world of difference between a trailer and a home. Temporary versus permanent, quality and custom made by your own hands, or at least with the hand in the design process from start to finish, versus a plastic bubble of what can sometimes feel like the inside of a cramped airplane. I'd been in an RV, and don't get me wrong, I see the appeal, but this definitely was different. It felt like a home. 
I was immediately fascinated and I wanted to learn more, but there wasn't much more to find. Who was doing this? How? In all honesty, in my youthful ignorance, I didn't have the slightest clue how to buy a traditional home or what it really took to maintain anyway. That wasn't something you were taught in school. Owning my own home hadn't even really crossed my mind as something that I could achieve, at least not for a long time. Still, seeing this guy work on his own little home inspired a spark in me that I carry to this day and was just the beginning of my journey in tiny living and alternative housing. For me, that was the beginning of an education that I hope to share with you here. As it turns out, building my own tiny house on wheels wasn't in my future, but almost every other kind of tiny living was. That relationship I was in didn't last, and shortly after I found a new opportunity in Lake Tahoe, California, where one of my sisters was living. I put that particular dream on hold, sold everything, packed my life into two suitcases, and flew across country. Going from Florida to California is a big change. Lake Tahoe was the Silicon Valley, a Silicon Valley destination for the uber rich. I had to work twice as hard to afford half as much. But I got lucky again. Where most locals have to share a home or an apartment with three or four more roommates just to be able to afford to live, I found a new little corner to call my own. This time it was a studio apartment above a breakfast cafe in the small village of Kings Beach. And it was tiny. This place was probably only 120 square feet. I had enough room for a futon, a small table, and the kitchenette that had a mini fridge and a two burner hot plate. In fact, I had to step outside of my studio into an adjacent hallway just to get into my bathroom. But from my second story window, through a sparse tree line, I could see the sparkle of gorgeous Lake Tahoe. So the trade-off was worth it. Besides, I worked so much, I wasn't there long enough to feel bothered by such a small space. Fast forward another two years, pursuing another dream, and I buy a one-way ticket to Thailand. Again, I purge all of my belongings, say goodbye to my Tahoe family, and spend nine weeks traveling Southeast Asia. It's the experience of a lifetime. Knowing what I know now, had I bought a home before then, tiny or not, I probably never would have taken a trip like that. Since then, I've spent a few seasons working on a farm right here in upstate New York, where, full circle moment, I lived in an RV. This was an older one, it wasn't gonna see the road much more, if at all. I enjoyed my summer there, but once the temperature started to drop, those thin trailer walls simply would not retain the heat that was constantly forced through the vents using propane. It was a very ex expensive and impractical way to live. Now that same year, I received an invitation to stay on my friend's father's land in a tiny house that he had built himself for the winter. He had built this next to his own home. It was about 350 square feet, and this one was fully off-grid. There were solar panels on the roof and a hand-dug pit with a septic tank that occasionally needed to be pumped to be emptied. The hot water tank was only able to supply enough hot water for exactly seven minutes, so I learned to time my showers precisely. And the only heat came from a wood stove in the kitchen. My task that winter, in exchange for reduced rent, was to keep the place warm so the pipes didn't freeze. You see, this home was built not on a full foundation, but piers. That means that any piping carrying liquid in or out of the home could be susceptible to freezing if not insulated properly or kept warm. It, if it's not, then it can lead to a very big and very expensive mess. Dutifully, I kept a fire going every night and day all winter. At the time, I was waiting tables and often came home quite late. Even though I'd leave a nice and toasty tiny home before my shift in the afternoon, by the time I came back at two or three in the morning, the fire had burned out and the temperature in the house would read 35 degrees. I'd spend the next 30 minutes building a fire just to warm it back up again, enough for me to finally crawl into bed and go to sleep. I now understand that this house, while cozy and secure to me, wasn't exactly code compliant. I tell you all this because each of these experiences taught me a great deal. Over the last 12 years, I've lived in a tiny house on wheels, despite it being stationary, an off-grid tiny home, a tiny apartment, and a more traditional micro-cottage. Living tiny can take many forms and should not be mistaken for a trend, but rather looked at as a new approach to an older way of life, for an evolving society and its changing needs. Despite the differences in each of these dwellings, the popularity of the tiny home can still largely be attributed to that tiny house on wheels. 
This is when you take elements of a traditional house build, but build on a trailer frame or chassis. And in these designs, I saw a lot of improvements over what I had experienced. So we're gonna go over exactly what that means as this has been a major source of confusion for many curious and aspiring tiny house dreamers. There are important things to know about the methods and definitions of different tiny homes. Who makes these definitions and how housing and RVs are categorized and regulated. The International Code Council, or ICC, is the organization that creates the International Residential Code, or IRC. The IRC is a model building code used throughout the United States. All individual states model their own building code from the IRC. So individual appendices can then be adopted into each state. This allows flexibility and building requirements depending on location. For example, in New York, we have to worry about our long and sometimes harsh winters. So we are required to build our homes with a higher R value or a higher degree of insulation. Our friends down south don't have to worry about that as much. But let's say we are down south or in a place like Kentucky where there are mild winters but a greater threat of tornadoes or higher wind zones. The homes built in these zones will have requirements for windows and doors that can withstand high impact. It's these kinds of variables that make the appropriate concessions necessary for the geographical diversity that we see throughout our nation. This code is where we get the definition of a tiny home. Commonly referred to as Appendix Q, this is where we start to see the legitimization of tiny living. This code covers all site-built and modular homes. Now, the difference between a site-built and a modular home is important for you to understand so that we can really grasp what is going on in this industry. Your typical traditional home will be built brick by brick and frame by frame by a local builder right there on site. There are many ways and styles to do this and the possibilities are only limited by your budget and of course, ability to adhere to local building code. A modular home is a home that you choose generally from a large selection of floor plans, customized to your liking and is built off site indoors and brought to your, to your prepared home site in pieces. The home is then pieced together and the finished product will be indiscernible from a site built home. This method of construction gives the average buyer a shorter build time in a controlled environment and a lower cost. Both styles of home adhere to the exact same code requirements. It is commonly misunderstood that a tiny home on wheels is a mobile home. It is not. Because that distinction is reserved to describe another type of housing regulated by the federal government. However, of course, there are some commonalities, hence the confusion. You are all probably familiar with HUD on at least a minimal level. HUD, or the Department of Housing and Urban Development, is essentially a federal regulatory agency that oversees the development of poor and underinvested communities. It also takes on the massive job of helping to provide and supplement housing stock in the United States. So that can mean anything from loan and insurance assistance programs through the FHA or the Federal Housing Authority, rental assistance like Section 8 or vouchers, public or subsidized housing for low-income families and individuals, and fair housing education and enforcement. Most importantly, in regards to providing housing stock, this same agency dictates the HUD code for a manufactured home. A manufactured home is the rebranded term for what many know as a mobile home. Now, the HUD code for a manufactured home differs from the conventional building code in quite a few ways, but most importantly for our understanding, they are required to be built on a permanent chassis or trailer. This is where most people get confused. So we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper. IRC is state and local ordinance specific, dictating standard building code for the site built and off site builds, in the case of modular. HUD is federally mandated, but specific to manufactured or mobile homes. Though recognized nationwide, mobile homes are restricted in placement by local municipalities in allocated zones, or they're limited solely to existing mobile home parks or trailer parks. Now that you understand these two primary governing bodies of housing code, let's discuss RVs. RVs, or recreational vehicles, 
are built to yet another standard. The Recreational Vehicle Industry Association is a standards developer accredited by the American National Standards Institute. Yes, there is an institute that oversees how standards are developed in just about every industry that you can think of. This has given a kind of build guideline and a standard that any RV builder must meet in order to be certified as an RV manufacturer. There are many classes of RVs from pop-up campers that a small sedan can tow, teardrop campers, toy haulers, all the way to a large drivable rig commonly referred to as a motorhome. The most common tiny house you've probably seen has been built to RV or park model RV standards. Park model RVs were probably the least popular type of RV before the tiny house trend took off. Park models were designed to be delivered to a site, usually a campground or someone's personal property, perhaps to be used seasonally or recreationally as a hunting camp. Prior to the, popular, <laughs> prior to the popularization of a tiny house on wheels, these looked almost identical to any other fifth wheel you may see being towed down the road. But they were also often built a bit bigger than a typical tow behind. So they would require oversized permits and semis to tow from the builder to the site. Generally speaking, these units, once delivered, stayed put, often even being connected permanently to septic systems, wells, and electricity. In the Northeast, that usually meant winterizing and shutting down for the winter, as most campgrounds are seasonal. However, once the interest in a movable tiny home became more serious, many were built to the standard road legal size, so the average person can reasonably tow their own home from place to place without requiring special permits, freeing them up to move around the country. This is where you see the tiny home movement really take off. The importance of a standardization should not be understated. Now this is something that you can insure and even finance. RVs have had financing for decades, but if you were trying to build a tiny home on, on wheels without any sort of certification, how does a lender know how to assess and structure a loan? This is usually considered personal property and have higher interest, interest rates than a mortgage, but still, it offered an option for the right buyer. Another important thing to understand in standards is that they dictate minimums. They're restricted primarily in that they cannot exceed 400 square feet. Anybody, any builder can build beyond a minimum. And this is where the fun begins. Since lofts and porches don't technically count as livable square footage, you're gonna to start to see those getting added on. Now, if you take a look here, I'm gonna show this is what is, this slide here is a trailer or a mobile home, um, now considered a manufactured home. So this is where the confusion is. This is, but this is kind of a typical standard or a typical photo, I would say, of uh, what we know of as a mobile home. Right here, you'll see a park model RV, previous to what uh, you start to see kind of become trendy in the tiny, house, the tiny house world. So this is where you start to see builders start to push the limits because right, while right here this is a park model, now so is this. And so is this. <laughs> So is this, and we'll go back to these. But right here, we've got another example too. This, these are all considered park model RVs, so you can see that they have a lot of differences. Now, now you don't have to do it yourself, and many still will, but people will start to get creative in their builds and they design the life that they want, catered specifically to their interests and hobbies. They're building these homes of their, of their nomadic dreams. When I'm with a client, one of the most important things I have them consider is what they want their dream life to look like. What is most important to you? Do you love to cook? Let's make sure you have a model with a larger kitchen. Play games with family? Do you use your bedroom just for sleeping or do you love to lounge and watch movies in bed? Do you spend a lot of time outdoors? Are there pets that we need to make room for? All of these prompted questions help people make the most of the space that they have and live the life that they envision for themselves. Most of the tiny homes you see on the road are what I call teeny tinies. To be able to tow anything without special permitting from the Department of Transportation in most states, you have to stay within certain size guidelines. This limits your width to eight and a half feet wide and your height to under 13 and a half feet. That means that your average tow behind tiny is gonna be about 180 to 240 livable square footage. 
for the right person, couple, or even young family, the minimalist lifestyle becomes achievable. Custom tiny home builders start popping up all over the country. Companies who have been building RVs start to see the demand, less plastic, more tile. Composting toilets and solar panels are integrated, making it easier to be independent and off-grid. Tiny home designs have integrated the best of both worlds, using quality construction that you'd expect of a new home, combined with mobility and environmentally friendly build and lifestyle elements. At the same time, alongside what began as the ultimate do-it-yourself project, born of financial necessity, the modern luxurious tiny home with a not so tiny price tag has also been born. While beyond the reach of some, these Pinterest worthy dreamy homes helped the tiny house movement garner even more attention. They may seem contradictory, but both are important pieces of this puzzle that I'm attempting to put together for you all today. So remember what you just learned, IRC, HUD, RVIA. We're gonna go back to this later. Environmental impact of tiny living. Although much more data really is needed, there was a wonderful study conducted by a colleague of mine in the industry, Dr. Maria Saxton. She conducted a detailed survey of 80 tiny home dwellers to measure their difference in their ecological footprint before and after downsizing. Amazingly, in her findings, all 80 participants lowered their ecological footprints by downsizing, even if using standard methods of construction. Even more, if they built their home themselves using locally sourced, used, and recycled materials. 85% of tiny homes are considered to have efficiency-centered designs, or were above average in energy efficiency. The average home size of those surveyed were living in 233 square foot homes, and prior to downsizing were living in 1,600 square foot homes. By simplifying their lifestyles, their behavior and consumption changed drastically and naturally. They found themselves purchasing more intentionally, such as sourcing local foods with less plastic packaging, naturally conserving water and energy, creating less waste, and recycling more. Using this data, she, she concluded that 366 million acres worth of resources could be saved if just 10% of Americans went tiny. That alone is a huge benefit to tiny living, but I think we'll find even more positive benefits as data becomes available over the next few years. Dr. Saxon found amongst her surveyed group that the top reasons to downsize were financial reasons, seeking a simpler life, environmental reasons, desire to travel, live a mobile lifestyle, or seeking a drastic lifestyle change. So those being the top reasons why someone might go tiny gives you a little bit of an idea of who is going tiny. I certainly had my own preconceived notions. And I wasn't wrong, but looking back, I had such a narrow view of who tiny homes were for. My first thought was young people, modern day hippies, people trying to stick it to the man, live off grid. Recent college grads burdened by student loans, looking for another way to have independence and financial freedom. A way to have security, but without that overwhelming commitment I myself was so afraid of during the last recession. There are noticeably clear benefits to living on the road, and in fact, more than a million Americans do. It's hard to say what portion of those living on the road are in what we recognize as tiny homes, but certainly that number is increasing. The majority of those living are living in some type of RV, van conversion, Winnebago, traveling in or with their home right behind them. They pull up to campgrounds, state or national forests, RV parks, making their backyard wherever they happen to get to before the sun sets. Working remotely or even seasonally as this kind of life can be lived well on an incredibly limited budget if you're savvy. Families are even homeschooling their children on the road. Many of us, and I include myself here, are fascinated by this lifestyle. But I've spent the last two years speaking to hundreds of people about making the changes to go tiny. And I quickly started to notice something unexpected. I'm guesstimating here, but I'd say that well over half of the inquiries I received were from baby boomers. For those of you unsure what a boomer is, beyond the sarcastic and hilarious memes created in defense of millennials, a baby boomer is an individual born in the United States between 19, the mid-1940s and the mid-1960s. 
The first few that I spoke to, I assumed, were just a small exception to the overall demographic. It didn't take long for me to start seeing the pattern. Modern day society has been a society of consumerism. We, the consumer, spend our lives acquiring stuff. I do it, my parents do it, my grandparents, who, were, who grew up with my great parents, great grandparents that survived the Great Depression, they certainly did it. Acquiring stuff can often give us a false sense of security that the stuff itself is valuable, that it is part of our resources or our wealth. But that idea and mentality can be very misleading. Any item, whether it be a teapot or a car, really has only two types of value. The monetary value of what you can get for it and the sometimes more difficult to measure value it brings to your life. In 1975, the average size of a single family home in America was 1,600 square feet. By 2018, that number had increased to 2,600 square feet. At the same time, the average size of the American family has decreased, meaning that we've been building bigger houses, not for our bigger families, but for all of our stuff. We spend valuable time and energy storing, cleaning, and organizing all that stuff. So here we have our boomers, and they are getting ready to retire if they haven't already. Their parents and in-laws have already aged out of their homes, and the boomers are the ones who have had to shoulder that responsibility. That is no simple task. My own grandfather passed away earlier this year. He and my grandmother had shared the same house for almost 50 years. And they were frugal, but they still had so much stuff. And it was just collecting dust everywhere you looked. Every cabinet was full. Every drawer was crammed with papers. And my mother and my uncle went through it all. It took the better part of a year Every weekend, every vacation, every spare moment, categorizing, giving away, cleaning, and donating, and just overall making sense of someone else's life through their stuff. On the best days, it was exhausting and emotional. They were constantly faced with deciding what was important. That's a hard thing to do for yourself, let alone the loved one you just lost. Some of it, like the boxes of slides holding hundreds of images of my mother's childhood, and the letters my grandparents exchanged while he was serving in the Navy were true treasures. But most of it was just stuff. And from that experience, my mother decided she would never put that emotional burden on her children. And she's not alone. These people are taking steps towards tiny living so they can simplify now, focus on what their true and current needs are, and let the house they've grown their family in be of use to another growing family. They have lived the American dream, and now they're ready for a new one. Now let's consider another scenario, same generation. You live an active life, but you're slowing down a bit. Maybe you've even had a major disruptor in your health, like cancer, hip replacement, knee surgery. You need a little help, but not a lot. You need to focus your energy on taking care of yourself and not your house. Mowing and shoveling are getting too difficult. You need something more manageable. Or let's say, your significant other passes unexpectedly. It's horrible and no one wants to think about it, but this happens. And now you're taking care of a home you once lovingly shared with your partner and you're forced to reassess your future and what it will look like. Maybe that means being closer to your kids or your grandkids, helping to babysit more often. Your son or daughter have a large piece of property and they'd be thrilled to have you close by. You can help each other without stepping too far into each other's space. Here's another. You have a child with special needs that is now a young adult. Maybe they have outgrown living with mom and dad, but getting a place in the city is a little bit beyond what is reasonably expected to handle. Still, independence is vital to growth. Perhaps a tiny home placed directly on the same property, but separate from the primary home, can help parent and child both find a new kind of fulfillment and happiness. How many of you have or had a loved one in a nursing home? An already difficult situation turned into horrific tragedy with this pandemic. My family experienced it with my grandfather and I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. People with aging loved ones are looking for ways to keep them close and safe. For all of these reasons, it is important to have alternative options to explore in new and unexpected phases of your life. 
So let's rewind a little. The number one reason people look into going, finan er, going tiny is financial reasons, or essentially they're looking for affordable housing. Most of the scenarios that I described before indicate some form of built or inherited wealth. If you have a home to sell, generally speaking, you can then buy a new one. Obviously, that is not the case across the board. My initial idea of who wants to go tiny came from my own experience. I was a young adult, unsure of my place in the world, looking for both stability and flexibility. Not too much to ask, right? It shouldn't be. How can someone find their place in this life without solid ground to stand on? Average rent pricing has increased where average wages have not. Youth experiencing homelessness could fill a city the size of Chicago every year. More than half a million people across the nation are unhoused, 92,000 of them right here in New York State. Clearly a problem already. It has only grown since the COVID-19 pandemic began. An analysis was done recently by Dr. Brendan O'Flaherty, a professor of economics at Columbia University, and it projects, that an, incre and it projects an increase in homelessness by 40 to 45% this year. That is right now. Even those of us living comfortable lives have had to deal with disastrous repercussions. So can we imagine what this must be doing to our fellow citizens living paycheck to paycheck? What about the children who are aging out of foster care? 24,000 children age out of foster care, out, out of the system every year, meaning that once they turn 18, they are completely on their own. 20% of them will become instantly homeless. We're talking about actual children here. And of course, there are our heroes, our veterans. Why are they so often forgotten? They go to war for us only to come home to the same challenges that all of our most vulnerable population face in addition, in addition to the scars of war, scars that we can't always see. On a single night in January of last year, more than 37,000 veterans were experiencing homelessness. These statistics are alarming. Some of, these are more some of these more shocking numbers were brought to my attention only recently. Running Upstate Tiny Homes has connected me with some deeply passionate, intelligent, and empathetic individuals and organizations, and I'm honored to be working alongside them. We have an incredible nonprofit based right here in Troy called Time for Homes. They aim to end homelessness in New York in, by 2025 using a recovery-oriented approach with sustainable solutions and by using the success in New York as a pilot program to roll out solutions nationwide. In my first conversation with the president, James Ryan, he shared his valuable insight to this problem and how they are working to address the root causes. They are not gonna slap a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. That's not gonna do it. They understand that these changes must be addressed where they start, not just where they spill over. On my end, I was able to convey the strengths and weaknesses that the tiny home community and industry is experiencing, and I immediately expressed my concern that we may not be where we need to be in terms of accessibility and affordable housing. Right away, he understood and assured me that introducing any housing stock at all is helpful. It alleviates some of the burden that the housing markets endures, helping costs remain steady and providing literal room for others to find shelter. Wonderful. Let's get to work. So here we are, we've got some momentum now. A definition, a recognition, a standard to build to, a couple of hit TV shows, plenty of demand and motivation to serve. We're in business, right? Not quite. We can agree that there is definitely some appeal to a mobile and nomadic lifestyle, but that is not the life for everyone. Almost every other example I just laid out were for people looking for something different, but not that different. They wanna stay in one place, whether it's for five or 10 or 30 years, and they're looking for a home, something affordable, stable, and safe. Renting doesn't allow you to build equity and can often cost much more than a mortgage, making it more difficult to save for that down payment. Maybe you're a young adult and you qualify for a mortgage, but your limit is only $150,000. The average cost of a home in New York State is almost $350,000, more if you live in the city, closer to three quarters of a million dollars. Even if you do find a home in the range that you can afford, chances are it's not new and will need some work. Maybe right away, maybe a year later, it can be easy, in this case, if it's already a stretch for your earning capacity, 
to buy something that quickly puts you in the position of being house poor. Still, the opportunity to build wealth through home ownership is vital to lifting a person out of the cycle of poverty. So what does this all mean? How are tiny homes going to help? We've discussed how tiny homes are defined by the IRC, and yet also how most are built to a particular ANSI-guided RV standard. Typically, yes, they are built well above the typical RV standard, but still this classification raises barriers in many places and probably in particular New York State. When I first began at Upstate Tiny Homes two years ago, I would walk my clients through the process of placing their home. The first few being on property they already own. I'd call the town on their behalf and speak with the clerk first. If you've never tried to get anything done through your town, you should know. Be nice to the clerk. Be nice always, but take extra care here. Often they've been doing their job for many years and can answer any question that you may have. If they don't know the answer, they know who you need to talk to to get the answer. I learned so much from the small town clerks in those first few months and I often felt like I was getting free legal advice. It can just as easily go the other direction. So the clerk is the first step. Then building inspectors, then zoning officers, and town supervisors. I'd speak to all of them, answering their questions and asking my own. At first, like with anything new, you don't know what you don't know. I'd explain what my client was trying to do so that I could ascertain what needed to be done in order to do it right. I had learned about the most important aspects of the builds, what it was, how it was certified, and these people, these professionals, were all scratching their heads. A park model RV, ANSI 119.5. I'd show them pictures, invite them to our lot to come take a look. They'd be completely impressed, and still, no one knew how to permit it. Scattercoke was one of my first attempts at acquiring permits. They were all so kind and patient. They wanted to make it work, but didn't know how. I went to a planning board meeting to make my case, and they were receptive and understanding, but ultimately was never able to secure final approval. I came across this again and again and again, with an occasional and varying degree of success. In New York, and not just New York, but in New York, a recreational vehicle means just that. Not a dwelling. If you're looking for a vacation property, if you want to rent a space in a campground to use yearly, or live in a town where RVs are allowed year round, this might work for you. In fact, I've spent the last year partnering with a landowner in the Adirondacks to develop their property as a year-round campground, a rare occurrence in the Northeast, and our first home will be placed in just a few weeks. Mostly though, I was banging my head against the wall. I had all this demand, qualified prospects, and I was running into dead end after dead end. You see, most people are looking to live in a tiny home. Full-time, with a mailbox, toilet, running water, the whole nine. In order to receive the appropriate permits, including a certificate of occupancy, the building inspector must approve the build. That can mean, if you're building a home on site, that town, that, that town's inspector will come to your site, stop by and check on your progress, making sure you're using the appropriate materials, that your site prep is done properly, and so on. Even if a park model is built to the exact specifications required, but built elsewhere and delivered fully finished to the site, how does that local inspector ensure that that job is actually done the way it's supposed to be? They can't. Not this way, anyway. Eventually, all of these roadblocks lead me to the state. I speak with several state officials in the building code department, I make more connections within the industry, and finally, things start to make more sense. Remember when I said tiny homes were only recently defined and that the IRC, where all of our building codes come from, had defined them? They did this through an appendix known as Appendix Q. And that can, but, and that can be individually adopted by each state. Appendix Q not only defines tiny homes, it allows concessions in the build appropriate to its size. Modern building code isn't usually stripped down over time, but added to. And since the average home size had continued to increase over the course of the last several decades, the code was built around those facts. But what is standard for a 2,600 square foot home is actually incredibly difficult to achieve when you start planning a home that is as tiny as three or 400 square feet. 
This addresses things like smaller staircase builds, ceiling heights, loft landing platforms, and installation requirements. These concessions have several important implications to help expand tiny living as a permanent and permissible dwelling in New York State and anywhere else in the country if it's adopted. So, through my persis persistent search for answers, the state officials and my colleagues, I learned that Appendix Q is up for adoption in New York State in September of 2019. Public comments are welcome, and we are able to submit quite a few additional supportive co comments at the time. Not much later, I am thrilled to learn that it has passed and will be mandated throughout the state sometime in the spring of 2020. And so it became official in May. Finally, a much needed victory. This is big in the tiny world. And we should celebrate every victory, but we're not quite finished. There is still the issue of accountability in a build process and zoning. Now, please understand that I am fully aware of the tiny home roller coaster that I've taken you on. So please let me restore a little faith from a source that may surprise you. I'd like to read you a quote from the HUD website that I came across just before I learned of Appendix Q last summer. On June 25th, 2019, President Donald Trump signed an executive order establishing the White House Council on eliminating, eliminating Barriers to Affordable Housing and named HUD Secretary Ben Carson as its chairperson. The council consists of members across eight federal agencies and engage with state, local, and tribal leaders across the country to identify and remove the obstacles that impede the production of affordable homes, namely the enormous price tag that follow burdensome re government regulations. Research indicates that more than 25% of the cost of a new home is a direct result of federal, state, and local regulations. For this reason, in recent years, the construction of new multifamily and single-family dwellings has not kept pace with the formation of new households. The Census Bureau data indicates that from 2010 to 2016, only seven homes were built for every 10 households formed. As a result, Americans have fewer housing opportunities, including the opportunity to achieve sustainable home, home ownership, which is the number one builder of wealth for American families. I share this not to be divisive, but because the relevance is clear. As James Ryan, president of Time for Homes said to me, the need for housing stock is imperative to addressing homelessness and poverty. Navigating these regulations over the last two years has been frustrating and difficult, but I consider my time invested and returned with the knowledge that change is taking place and will have a domino effect of improving people's lives. And I also admit it's a little validating to see the government acknowledge that it can often get in its own way. It is unclear what this council will um, confirm from this, from this administration, but there are some bright sides. And the, I would like to talk about what the future of tiny homes will look like and how you can help. First, Appendix Q really does make a difference in placing tiny homes. It, can, it, it also creates reasonable safety measures, and the leniencies reflected in the new tiny house code create a guide to build a safe and practical home that can still be built to accommodate your personal needs and also be treasured for many years. Because this is now recognized by a housing authority, you'll be able to mortgage a tiny home. That means better access to a variety of lenders, low interest loans, and your investment in a tiny home will be considered real estate, not personal property. You will be liable for taxes, but often a smaller home or parcel means a lower tax assessment as well. So overall, you'll, you're still able to build wealth on a slightly smaller scale by investing in your own tiny home. Second, because this has been mandated into the state code, every town and country has adopted this. Every town and county, sorry. Every town and county, that's important. That means when you call to ask about tiny homes, they'll have an idea what to do and how to guide you. The other potential barrier that you may face in building tiny anywhere in the United States is going to be zoning. This is a huge part of the difficulty in placing a tiny home in New York with the RV classification. Southern states have quite a few more year-round campgrounds already, but there are not so many in the Northeast. The tiny home community at Long Lake took three years to get the appropriate approvals and zoning. Zoning regulations can also dictate the minimum size of a single family dwelling. But already, this has been a race in our capital city of Albany. In some places, it's never been instated at all. The other aspect to understand about zoning are that lo it, for local municipalities and regulations are, are on ADUs. ADUs are accessory or attached dwelling units like a garage apartment, 
and they've been used for generations and really come in handy in many situations. You can bring in a tiny home, affix it to your property, and in many cases even connect to the same utilities that the primary home uses. This can become a rental property or an in-law unit, a guest house, or any other type of housing you may end up needing. In either of these cases, if you come up against restrictions, you can file a variance, essentially asking for an exception in your case. Besides helping you get permission to build tiny, this also gives that town or city the chance to take a harder look at their potentially outdated zoning regulations. Sometimes it's difficult to make a change unless there is a good reason to, and I think you'll find more community support than you might expect. Places like Albany have already taken steps to create more efficient uses of infill lots, which are places within the city that may be too small for a standard home, but could be zoned to accommodate dwellings under 1,000 square feet. This creates more development, home ownership, and community growth important to the revitalization of urban areas. Lastly, I recommend that you use the resources you probably don't even know you have. Thea and Atha are excellent organizations and are well worth a small membership fee for the educational resources that they offer. Nowadays, every, every town has a website and so much information is listed right at your fingertips. Zoning minutes and town codes are almost always listed and with just a little bit of practice, you'll know how to find what you're looking for as quickly as anything you can look up online. Get involved in local politics. I mean it, local. <laughs> I'd never been to a town board meeting before I started this. These people are making decisions that can affect your life. Don't you wanna know what they're about? And it's important that they hear from you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. That's about it and I would love to take some questions because I'm sure that was a lot to take in for all of you. <laughs> it was a lot for me to write down. Okay, so let's see, we've got some questions here. What advice would you give to someone who is looking to live minimally? Oh, that's a great question. It's really important for you to think about what really matters in your life. I would say, um, picture your dream life. What does it really look like? What's really important to you? When you can purge some of those things that are holding you down, you think about all the time that you spend cleaning or organizing stuff, how often do you really use it? It's important to think about what you can get rid of so that you can make space for the things that really matter in your life. And then the last question is good. It's what's your favorite thing about tiny living? I actually don't live tiny right now. <laughs> so I have to say that I wrote this entire thing in my very spacious office, so I'm a little bit of a hypocrite. But I have lived tiny, and I would say that the best thing that I, that I really liked about living tiny is that I spent a lot more time outside. I really enjoyed um, going to the beach when I lived in Florida, going to the lake when I lived in Lake Tahoe. Um, and of course, when I went to Thailand and I was living out of a backpack, it was certainly a lot easier to just get out and explore. So those are some things that I really appreciated about living tiny. All right, thank you.